Now we will go more in depth in your CNA education. Welcome to module five, routine care procedures. We will be looking at the different types of vital signs and talking about how to accurately collect data. Objectives are to discuss components of vital signs, identify importance of obtaining vital signs, identify observations to report to the supervisor or nurse. Vital signs include taking temperature, counting pulse, counting rate of respiration, taking blood pressure, observing and reporting pain. Those are the five components of vital signs. Temperature is the measurement of the amount of heat in the body. Pulse is the number of times the heart beats in one minute. Respirations are the number of inhalations and exhalations combined taken in one minute. Blood pressure is the force of blood in the heart's arteries. Pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is, existing whenever they say it is. Why is it important to take vital signs? It, it provides a baseline of data to compare to at a later time as it can show a change indicating illness or a disease process. Vital signs may also indicate whether or not a medication is effective. Temperature is the first vital sign that you will take. We'll learn about it now. There are five different types of temperature we can take. You could do an oral temperature, which is taken under the tongue with the mouth closed, a rectal temperature, which is taken via the rectum, an axillary temperature, which is conducted under the armpit, a tympanic temperature, which is obtained in the inner ear, and then a temporal temperature, which is taken by running a thermometer over the forehead and temporal artery. Factors that may affect temperature could include the time of day that the temperature is taken, medications that have been taken, environmental temperature around, smoking, and age. If taking an oral temperature, ask the resident if they have had anything to eat or drink, smoked, or had any exercise in the last 10 to 20 minutes. These things affect temperature. Oral temperatures are the most common route to use, however, a rectal temperature is always more accurate. A normal temperature can be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, but normal can be a degree cooler or a degree warmer than 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. An oral temperature can range from 97.6 to 99.6. A temporal temperature runs a little bit warmer, 98.6, to 100.6 is the normal range. And an axillary temperature runs just a little bit cooler, one degree below an oral temp. 96.6 to 98.6 is the normal range for axillary. Tympanic and rectal temperatures will also fall under the same range as oral. In order for an oral temperature to be obtained and accurate, the person will need to be able to close their mouth around the thermometer for up to a minute or more. Being unconscious, confused, disoriented, paralyzed, maybe from a stroke, or if there's a facial trauma, being younger than six years old, or having any other injury to the face or neck may indicate that we need to try something other than an oral temperature. Other examples of not using oral thermometers would be if the resident is on oxygen, has a nasogastric tube, or NG, we call it for short, if they have mouth sores or um, swelling in their mouth, any recent dental work, anything like that. If they've had recent seizures, we would not want to put anything in their mouth. We would try another route. Please report to the supervisor any elevation in temperature or an increase in skin temperature. If someone is running a fever, the nurse may be able to treat them. If someone is extremely cold, that's also something we want to know. So anything out of normal range needs to be reported. Next, we'll check the pulse. You can think of the alphabet in remembering the order of taking vital signs. Temperature is T, P for pulse, then we'll do respiration. 
We have several areas on the body where we can obtain a pulse. The most common is the radial pulse, and that is the only method you'll be required to count for a full minute as a CNA. The apical is the one over the heart. You will not be checking that heart rate. You will be finding the brachial artery and palpating, which is feeling, for a brachial pulse when you practice blood pressure. The brachial pulse is inside the elbow, about one to one and a half inches above the elbow, and slightly inside the arm. The radial is along the thumb, the thumb side of your arm, uh, right on your wrist. You can see on that image, it shows what blood vessel is being felt. Pulse assessment, measuring pulse in includes the number of beats, but also the quality. The pulse rate normally is 60 to 100 beats per minute for an adult. We will expect you to count a full minute when you take a pulse. Do not take a pulse for half a minute and multiply it by two. Factors that can affect pulse are age, medication, pain, and diseases. While you are counting the beats, take notice of the pattern. Is the pulse always regular or do you feel that the pulse speeds up and slows down or pauses? Does it start up again quickly? Is it irregular is what we would call that. The pulse being strong or being weak is also important to notice. Respirations is next. Respirations is simply watching someone take breaths in and out. It's an inspiration and an expiration. The trick is to observe this without the resident knowing you are watching them breathe. If you tell a resident you are counting their breaths, most likely they will think about it and change their rate of breathing. A normal respiratory rate for an adult is 12 to 20 breaths in one minute. Factors that may affect the respiratory rate include age, medication, diseases, and emotions. As with pulse, we observe for both the rate and overall the pattern. Is the breathing regular or does breathing slow down and speed up or even stop? That is called apnea, when there is a pause of time where no breaths are noticed, apnea. Does the resident look like they struggle to breathe? That is called dyspnea. Do they have shortness of breath? Is it noisy? Are they wheezing? Let us know right away if there's any trouble. Here are some observations that you also need to report immediately. The complaints of shortness of breath, someone gasping for hair, someone having a bluish color of skin, their nails, and their lips. If their breathing is slow, less than 12 per minute. Any abnormal sounds, the gurgling and crackling in the lungs is a sign that there's fluid. We end with blood pressure. Blood pressure is the force of blood in the heart's artery. The systolic pressure is the top number of blood pressure, and that is when the pressure is at its greatest in the heart. The first heart sound you hear when you check a blood pressure is the systolic blood pressure number. We'll look at a dial and we will hear a pulse. The first beat we hear on the dial is the systolic number. The systolic number will always be higher than the diastolic. The diastolic pressure is the bottom number. This is when the heart is at rest and the blood has returned to the heart and fills the chambers. The last pulse we hear when we check blood pressure is the diastolic pressure. We'll listen for the blood pressure in lab. A normal blood pressure reading has changed in the past years. At one point, normal was 120 over 80, and there may be staff that say this is normal, but now we have a new baseline. Doctors want to see the number lower so that we can help the population with our increasing rise of heart disease and high blood pressure. Now we want a systolic pressure to be between 100 
and 119 for the systolic, and the diastolic should be between 60 and 79. The symbol MMHG is an abbreviation for millimeters mercury, which is what we have classically used to measure pressure. However, you can just write the fraction. Numbers above normal are called hypertension, and numbers below normal are called hypotension. Numbers below the normal could be excuse me, I'm going to move on to orthostatic hypotension, that last term, which is when a person stands up and their blood pressure drops significantly. In order to find out if somebody has orthostatic hypotension, they will need to have their blood pressure taken while they're sitting down. Maybe we'll have a three-point check. We'll have to check their blood pressure while they're laying down, sitting up, and then lastly, when they stand up, we'll very carefully help them stand, check their blood pressure. If they have a big drop in their blood pressure, then we need to be careful about how we position them when we stand them up. We'll have to be very careful with changes in position so that they don't black out or faint. Factors that can affect blood pressure also include age, gender, heredity, diet, medication, pain, and the presence of a disease. Findings to report to your supervisor would be any results above or below normal, complaints of lightheadedness or dizziness, or if you have an inability to hear the blood pressure, you should tell someone. Do not take blood pressure if these things occur. Prior to obtaining a blood pressure, please note that there are instances when a blood pressure cuff should not be placed on a resident's arm. Avoid the arm with an IV, intravenous line. Avoid the arm with an amputation, as well as the arm with a cast. Do not place a blood pressure cuff on an area with burns or injuries. Avoid the arm that is being used for dialysis which is done for people with kidney dysfunction. Use the opposite arm if a resident has paralysis on one arm due to a stroke. Do not use the arm on the same side of a mastectomy or any breast surgery. If needed, special blood pressure cuffs for thighs may be used if the arms are not an option. Ensure that cuffs are of proper size for arms or thighs. If it's too large for the resident, it indicates a false reading. And if it's too small, it can be a false reading. Pain is the unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. This pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is, existing whenever they say it does. Normally, the cognitive resident who is alert is asked to rate their pain on a pain scale to the nurse of 0 to 10. 0 is no pain, and 10 represents the very most intense pain. Residents who have cognitive impairment may be able to use the FACES scale. A FACES scale utilizes various faces running from very smiley and happy to very distressed and crying. Nonverbal indicators of pain may also be used to determine pain. Here are a few. The presence of squeezing eyes shut, holding or guarding a body part, in other words, protecting it from being touched or moved, someone that's frowning, grounding, grinding their teeth, has increased restlessness and agitation, has changes in their behavior, or if they're groaning. What we can do, ideally, would be to reduce their pain. We try to think of what measures there are besides medication first and try those alternatives. And then the nurse will assess when it's time to start the medication for pain. Report to your supervisor any pain that a resident is experiencing. 
continue to check on their resident often, assist the resident to change positions frequently, offer warm baths and showers, encourage slow deep breathing and relaxation, be patient, caring, gentle, and empathetic. Other alternatives could be offered like warm or cold packs, if the nurse gives permission, activities and snacks sometimes help for distraction and that sometimes is the best way to help someone get their mind off of their pain. Height and weight, that's usually taken on admission and utilized for baseline data. However, weights are generally collected on a weekly basis to monitor for potential problems, such as problems caused by medication, a disease, or a fluid imbalance. Factors that affect height can be the age and the disease process and factors that I just discussed that also affect weight. Types of scales that we use for getting height and weight, there are standing scales, which you're probably familiar with. Those scales um, are for people that can stand up. There's a scale that is in a bed. There's scales for people that are in chairs or lifts, platform scales where wheelchairs can be wheeled up on, and then the manual scales that may be digital. The most common scale today is the electric scale, and that just needs the push of a button to find a weight, and it can be averaged in um, pounds or kilograms. Most of these scales will require you to zero out the scale first before a person is seated on them. Findings that need to be reported to your supervi supervisor right away include unintentional weight gains and losses and a change of three or more pounds in one week. Um, any weight change is significant. It can add up over time. So we want to know what their weights are. This is the end of our first part of Module 5. You can take a break right now and we'll be back for Part 2.